Well, this evening we're still in Luke chapter 1. Will we ever get out of this first chapter? Yes, we will. All right. Tonight, the birth of John. The birth of John the Baptist, looking at his beginning tonight and trusted some facets and things about even his pre-birth will be a help and a blessing to us tonight. We're in Luke chapter 1. We're looking at verses 56 to 66. We'll read it, and then we'll go to prayer and jump into the message tonight. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse number 56. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. And they called him Zacharias, after the name of his father. And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. And they said to her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed, and he spake and praised God. And fear came on all that dwelt round about them. <clears throat> and all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. Let us pray. Father, thank you tonight for this passage of Scripture. It's neat to see how uh, Dr. Luke crams so much in such a, a few lines. But there's a lot here. And we ask, Lord, tonight that you would uh, speak to us through this word, this passage of Scripture. Uh, may we grow. May we become strong. Uh, may there be something here tonight that is going to really uh, get us going uh, for you. Uh, we ask that you would speak to us here by way of technology and then those who will listen in the future. It's so marvelous uh, the way you have organized things today and how much the word can get out. And so we give you praise, give you thanksgiving for that. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill me now for this message and trust and depend in you tonight. Uh, I can't do this without you. Only you can do this. And so we trust, we depend in you and in you alone. So give us a great time now in this passage of Scripture. It is your word, it is eternal truth. Blessed to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, John the Baptist is one of those guys that is uh, amazing in that there are accounts of the births of great people that we've heard about in the past. Of course, the even greater account of a birth is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But we do know about John is that he was destined and we know that he was going to be a great man of God. And so John is way up on that list of births of great people who were going to go out and do great things for God. And so he is John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Messiah. In our first point tonight, we're going to look at John's birth. John's birth in verses 56 through 58. I'm going to reread these verses again as we go. And there's a, a neat point here as we get started with these verses, 56 through 58. It said, or Luke says, And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. Now here's the question. Did Mary take off and go home before John was born? What do you think? I don't think so. 
I don't know so. But I don't think so. Let me just throw a question out here to you, to you mothers. All right? Let's say you were with somebody special in your family for three months. And this person is about to give birth. And uh, she has now gone into labor. Would you say, oh, it's, I, I'm sorry, but I got to go home now. Do you think that's what you would... <laughs> the men are laughing more than the ladies. <laughs> I don't think she would have done that. I really don't. We don't know that for sure. But uh, one of the guys that, that I, I read said that, uh, says that uh, this was Luke's way of wrapping up the story of Mary here in verse 56. He said he's just wrapping it up. It doesn't mean that she wasn't there for the birth. So I find that interesting. So my style, this is not the gospel, but I, I find it hard to believe that Mary would take off and run home right when John was going to be born. So you, you can believe whatever you want, and I will too on that, all right? But that's uh, interesting about the birth of John. Was Mary still there? Well, we know that she went to visit Elizabeth at the beginning of her own pregnancy, and Elizabeth was already six months along with John. And so there's a three-month period that's going to go by. And so let's say that, that, uh, that Mary was still there when John was born. Wouldn't that have been neat if uh, whoever was there and helping with the birth would have said to Mary, here, you give John to his mother. I mean, you just spent three months here. Why don't, why don't you do that? Why don't you give the baby to his mother for the first time? That would have been a neat thing. And I'm sure they had uh, some really special times there. And if Mary was present there, she witnessed joy unspeakable. This was a very, very happy occasion and would be as the days go by. And so at John's birth, there had to be lots of tears of joy and laughter uh, in the home. And then it just spreads across the hillside and the countryside. This is, this is a miraculous birth going on here. This is awesome. This wasn't supposed to happen. This is a God thing. God did this. And so Luke tells us here in these first three verses that we're looking at that Elizabeth's neighbors and relatives heard that Jehovah God had shown her great mercy. And now they are all sharing in the joy and, and the tears and the laughter the secret's out. I mean, the, it was kept a secret for a good long time, but no. And everybody knows that this child is destined for greatness. So sub-point A under our first point tonight, we're going to look at the circumcision. The circumcision. And that happens in 59, uh, the beginning of 59 and, and going down through 63. And, and it came to pass... That on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. I think I'll just stop right there with that. The circumcision. Well, where did all this start? Well, if you go way back to Genesis chapter 17, verse 12, that's where God told Abraham, you're going to circumcise every Hebrew male, and you're going to do it eight days after they're born. That's what's going to happen. It was then formalized in the Mosaic Law in Leviticus. So the whole family came together for this happy occasion. However, the circumcision was not a happy occasion for John. But everybody else, it's, a, it's like a, a, a wonderful get-together. We're getting the family together for this, and it's going to be great. So circumcision would mark the boy with the sign of the covenant and incorporate him into the nation of Israel. This also obligated him to live under the commands of the law and share in the blessings of God's chosen people. So here's the little John, the baby. He's crying out in pain. Zacharias is cleaning his knife and there were cheers all around. This is a for everybody but John, this is a very, very 
happy occasion, the circumcision of the little boy. Letter B, naming, the naming of John. The naming, we go to uh, verse 59b and following. And they called his name Zacharias after the name of his father. And his mother answered and said, Not so. He shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. The naming. Well, the naming of the baby was also a very enlightening moment. This, this is a big deal here, the birth of John in many ways. And here we come now to the naming of this baby boy. <clears throat> Everyone assumes, well, look, we already have Big Zack. Now we're going to have Little Zack. That's how you do it. That's the way you did it in the Bible times. Big Zack, Little Zack. That's the way it is. Well, Elizabeth says, not so. And in the Greek rendering, it, it really says, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. See, all the, all the cousins and the family are all gathered around, and, and they're all trying to name the baby. No, you don't. No, that's not the way this is. So we have a big commotion. Isn't that great? Family get together, and now I have a big commotion about the name of the little boy. Isn't it great? Kind of like a lot of folks at Thanksgiving dinner, where you have uh, the Republicans and the Democrats all seated at the same table. That's not a happy occasion all the time. So there's a big commotion here about the naming of the boy. Got to make a decision. So daddy writes on the tablet, his name is John. Now, of course, all the family and friends that are there, they didn't know that Gabriel has been there. Gabriel has come and Gabriel has told them what they are to name this boy. Specific instructions. They were not clued in on that. And so... For us today, it's kind of hard to, to realize how difficult this was because they always used a name for a child that was already in the family line. All right, now a lot of people still do that uh, to this day, but for them, th this is the way you did it. This is how you did it in the land of Israel, but not on this occasion. God had other things in mind. So the name John is going to continue to stir things up in their imaginations. I mean, this, this whole get-together is going to soon be over. They're going to go back to where they live, and they're going to keep thinking about this. They're going to keep thinking about the name of this little baby boy. Letter C, praise. Praise, verse number 64. Got a lot of praise going on here. Uh, and his mouth, this is Zacharias, and his mouth was opened immediately. Huh. His name is John, and boom, he can talk again. And his tongue was loosed, and he spake and praised God. That is what it was about. It was a praise God time. So the relatives and the neighbors have just recovered from one heart attack about the naming of, of the boy, and, and now we've got a second heart attack coming. Here he is, and he's talking again. He hasn't talked in nine months, and here we go. And what is his subject? Praise to God. Praise to God. That is what it is all about. He is, th this man is a believing believer, and he's had nine months to become a better believer. He's been thinking, and he's been growing, and he's been meditating, and he's been studying. He has had lots of time to grow in his faith, and this is a great moment for him. I mean, after all, he's been in jail for nine months, and now he is free. And what does he do? He praises God. He doesn't get worked up. He doesn't get mad. Why did you do this to me, Lord? No, not at all. He praises God the Lord. And then letter D, we see the response, the response in verses 65 and 66. And 
fear came on all that dwelt round about them, and all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. Now this verse number 66 is a lot like when the Lord Jesus was born. And Mary laid up all these things in her heart as well. So here we have it for Elizabeth. We're going to have it for Mary in the not too distant future. So the response. All of this brought a spiritual revival to the area. I mean, this has really cranked up the spiritual level here. What's going on here with the birth of this miraculous little baby boy? And so there's a healthy fear and awe of God that had spread over the countryside and the hillside. The people were taking this in. Little revival going on here. And these people knew that God was at work. They didn't miss it. They knew that God was at work and their souls were thrilled about what God was doing. Spiritual reflection. A wise and spiritually healthy state is rare in our world today. But I'll tell you what, this COVID thing, I believe, has revived a lot of Christian hearts. Made a lot of people stop and think. A lot of awakenings have gone on in the lives of believers today. And that's a good thing. On this day, the big question was, what is this child going to be? What is this child going to do? We want to know this is going to be something else with this boy. So that same question is going to arise time and again with these people. For years to come, this question is going to come up. What is this child going to be? What is he going to do? And then one day, John the Baptist steps onto the world stage. And he steps onto the world stage as the greatest witness the world has ever seen. So we know, we know what this, this child is going to be and what he is going to do. That brings us to our second point tonight. Now, I've covered the whole scripture. You're thinking, oh, he's done. No, I'm not done yet. But <laughs> still have a little ways to go. We're going to look at point number two, and we're going to look at some things about John. So first of all, uh, in point number two, John's biography. John's biography. We only get one sentence about John's upbringing in the whole New Testament and that comes at the end of this chapter in verse number 80. One verse. That's all we get. Verse 80. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. Wow. Now, you only get one sentence, but this is what you get. This is, this is amazing. He grew, he waxed strong in spirit, and he's in the deserts until the day of his showing unto Israel. So he's out there for a good while, many years. Moses was out there for, I think, 40, getting prepared. John's out there, he's getting prepared. So what happens here? John spends years in the desert until about A.D. 27. When he received his call during the priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, who are going to be real prevalent in those days of John the Baptist and the public ministry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So then, in A.D. 27, John is now a man, he has grown up, he has been trained by God, and he bounds onto the stage as a bigger-than-life Old Testament prophet. And people will swarm to hear his message. Subpoint so A, John's character. His character. A few points about his character. Number one is his style. His style. Mark's gospel tells us that John wore clothing of camel's hair. And he had a special diet of locusts and wild honey. Mark 1.6 tells us that. 
uh, he, he, camel's hair robe, leather belt, eating locusts and wild honey. Very low key, right? <laughs> Very low key. His dress was a powerful prophetic statement. His camel's hair robe was like that that the very, very poor people wore. So he identified with that. And then, diet, not fancy. His dress was a protest against the materialism of his day. A call to separate oneself from the sinful culture, to repent and to live a life that is focused on God. His living in the desert emphasized all of these things, his style. Number two is his courage. His preaching matched his profile. He was a fearless preacher. When he went out, he proclaimed the message that God wanted him to give. He called the Pharisees a pack of vipers to their face. He gave the commoners a lot of practical instruction. He told the tax collectors, you guys need to be fair. Stop ripping the people off. He told the Roman soldiers, you need to be content and, and you need to just cool it with a lot of your high and heavy handed uh, behavior. So he addressed a lot of people. John was as fearless as he looked. Three, his character, so we have his style, his courage. Number three, we have his humility. Along with his courage, he was a very humble man. And when Jesus comes on the scene, what does he do? He points the finger to Christ. There's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. His followers were all worked up about that. You know the story. Oh, Jesus comes on the scene, people are listening to him and all of his preaching, and John's followers are like, uh, what's up with that? Hey, have times changed? Not really. Still the same today. People get worked up when somebody else comes on the scene. And John's answer is truly amazing. We'll turn to John chapter 3 and see his answer. John chapter 3, 27 to 30. John 3, well, let's go back to 25 and catch the things that I just talked about. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. You yourselves bear, witness, bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. There is the best answer in the world. And that's our answer today too. He must increase and I must decrease. John the Baptist, great, great man of God. John was as humble as his robe suggested that he was. John embodied his message of repentance and holiness. He was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. That's big. He was a Nazarite. He doesn't touch dead bodies. He does not drink alcohol. He does not go to the barber shop. All these things are signs of radical commitment to God. That's what that was about. It was a radical commitment to God. He was so godly that his message just oozed out of him when he preached. He preached with fire and God used him to reach the multitudes, hundreds of thousands, would hear John preach. They would hear him preach. He would preach on repentance from their sins. 
they would be baptized. This whole deal was in, in, indeed a miraculous thing. Letter B, John's message. John's message. Now this is a very interesting part uh, of his life because he is preaching before the cross, okay? He's preaching before the cross. He can't preach uh, before the cross about the blood of the cross, right? Can't do that. So that kind of throws people for a loop sometimes. So John preached on sin and repentance. Those were the big things, sin and repentance. The two essential facets of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So number one, sin. Number one is sin. Church history has demonstrated, it's demonstrating right now, again and again, that the importance of preaching about the terrible reality and consequences of sin has to be repeatedly recaptured by the church. And it has to be recaptured by the church right now in America because with the church by and large, has fallen away from that. Not preaching on sin. It has to be preached on. John the Baptist shows us that. Sin and repentance. People would sit by the Jordan River by the hundreds. And then thousands would come. And they would listen to John preach against their sin. Calling for justice and warning them about judgment. People have to understand, if they're going to get saved, people have to understand several things. Number one, they have to understand the depth of their own sin. You're not getting saved until you understand how, uh, how big of a rotten sinner you are. Got to get that. Have to get that. All right? Number one. Number two, they have to understand the incarnation of Jesus Christ. They've got to get the virgin birth of Christ. Thirdly, they've got to understand the sacrificial blood of Jesus on the cross and before the cross. And number four, they have to understand his resurrection from the tomb. If people do not see themselves as radically sinful and totally lost, the cross doesn't make sense to them. Why do I need that? I'm good. Why do I need to be saved? I don't sin. I'm not a bad person. They have to get that. I'm a radical sinner. And my sin is going to send me straight to hell when I die. But thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus who was born of a virgin. He was born perfect. He is God. He shed his blood for me. He rose from the tomb. People have to get that. And when people get those four things, then they understand. And the gospel becomes the best thing they've ever heard in the world. Number two is repentance. So his message was number one, sin. Number two, he preached on repentance. John's preaching was for a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, this does not mean that baptism saves, as some people believe. It demonstrates a heart repentance that always accompanies saving faith. The salvation that comes only through the grace of our great God. John's baptism is later superseded by Christ's baptism of the Holy Spirit. Turn one page or two to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, 16. I kept thinking to myself, you're going to go to John 3, 16 and read the wrong verse. Luke 3, 16. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So John is the forerunner, and he's just, he, he's doing his part. He's doing what he's supposed to do, leading up to the Messiah himself really coming, and him providing salvation. 
So, nevertheless, John's preaching coupled the conviction of sin with the moral necessity of repentance. Here's a, a quick, short, neat definition of repentance. A volitional turning away from sin. That's what repentance is. A volitional turning away from sin. Those who are born again repent. And one evidence of their salvation is this. Ongoing repentance. We don't repent one time. We keep on repenting. We keep turning away from our sin. The bottom line, when the gospel is preached, it must include both the preaching of sin and judgment and the necessity of a faith that leads to repentance. When an individual is convicted of their sins and is willing to turn away from their sins, the next step is to humbly trust Christ alone for their salvation, believing in his shed blood and his resurrection. And the last thing is this, saved people keep on confessing and repenting from their sins. There's a sign of your salvation. I keep confessing my sins. I keep repenting. I keep turning away volish volitionally. I'm making the choice to turn away from that sin. So John the Baptist, he initiates, he's the forerunner, he gets the whole thing going. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people came out to hear, and it was big. It was big. And I, I'm getting, uh, I'm, I'm getting uh, real interested in finding out about all those people that he preached to, those hundreds of thousands of people, and what happened to them? Where did they go? How did they follow the Lord Jesus, whom John said, there he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your word. It is powerful. So full of wonderful truth. Thank you for being able to sit down here tonight and go over these things about the birth of John. And then looking at his character and his life and his preaching. And Father, today uh, we, we've really, we really need your help to keep this thing going. And uh, we do pray that all over this country that you will help the preachers and teachers and and uh, Sunday school teachers to preach the good news of the gospel, keep it before, uh, keep preaching on sin. And then, Father, we need uh, many in pulpits today to, to be revived in their convictions that they once held strongly. And then, on the other hand, there are many in pulpits that have never come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that needs to happen. And then their flocks will change like crazy. So, uh, we ask, Lord, that you'll do that, that you'll make it happen. So thank you for your word. Thank you for the power that it has. Thank you for what it can do in all of our hearts and lives. We give you praise. We give you thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.